Let's take a lesson from the goats, the greatest of all time. They have a secret. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Air Hug Community Podcast. If you're new here, this is a podcast that speaks to living better in the second half of your life. We are all about midlife and beyond, and here we come to talk about the good, the bad, the ugly, and everything in between. Sometimes we have guests, and a lot of times it's just me researching a topic that has come up in our gym over at Grateful Fitness. Hey, are you ready to get started? First of all, I have to let you know that, and this is funny because it's going to come up later, but um, we are under construction here. We are living without a kitchen and there is construction going on building the new kitchen and sometimes it gets loud. It's completely out of my control. So do me a favor, give me a little grace and let's just go with it. Okay, so who said it first? Trust the process. I'll get to that in a minute, but the secret that the goats know, the greatest of all time, is that they do have to trust the process to put in the work and do the practice, and I also may add that they understand the difference between doing the work and doing the work with intense focus. So today I want to talk about trusting the process, and by the way, do you know who said this first? I did not. So I had to look it up because I was curious and I thought you might appreciate this. But the Philadelphia 76ers, okay, their former GM, Sam Hinkie, said it first going into their season in the year 2013-14. So they were coming off of a losing season and Sam devised a plan which included drafting a team that would incorporate a star player. Being His thought was that they only have five players on a team, on a court, at any one time, and that a single player actually can have a huge impact. And so his plan, which seemed counterintuitive from the outside, included tra- trading away some of his top players so that he could get the top three picks in the draft. He had this plan, he stuck to it, and he focused on building his team player by player. So that's what started the trust of the process movement, if you will. And you can often hear 76ers fans chanting this. I did not know that. I'm not a 76ers fan. I'm not even an NBA fan. But I am a fan of the GOATs, the greatest of all times. And I am a fan of trusting the process in order to make a change in life. And this comes up a lot. And the reason I'm doing this now, this time of year, this is coming out in March at a time when maybe people are frustrated with the changes that they wanted to make at the beginning of the year. And this might be the time where people actually stop trusting the process and abandon whatever it was they were doing in order to jump on something else and try something different because they didn't trust the process long enough. So that's why I thought this would be a lovely time to have this conversation. However, if you're listening to it at a later date, of course, it's applicable anytime. So what I want to say is we're going to talk about trusting the process when we decide to make a change. And like I said, typically this happens in the new year And at some point in time, people quit on the process because they haven't seen what they want to see. And that can happen for a number of reasons, right? It could happen because they haven't actually been putting in the hours of work or they haven't been focused on what they need to be doing when they have been taking those actions. So this involves putting fear aside in doing the small actions that consistently align with your desired change. So two areas where we commonly fall short are sticking to an exercise plan, right, or following a healthy eating strategy. 
And so I bring this up because these are conversations that midlife women have pretty much continuously. And I won't even say, I won't limit it to midlife. I mean, I've been hearing this conversation from women since about the time that I got to college, maybe even high school. But since this is a midlife podcast, we're going to keep it in the context of midlife living. Okay, so let's talk for a minute. How long does it take to master an action or to make an action into a habit? So, you know, we first have to recognize that the changes that we want to make are not something that we're doing for a 30-day challenge or a 21-day fix. These are changes that we have to recognize need to happen for life. So let's go back to the goats, the greatest of all time. Think like Serena, Michael Jordan, Tiger Woods. They had to put in the time and the effort to be focused on what they were doing, right? So it's time and effort. They had to do that in order to get where they wanted. Now I realize that healthy living, which is basically what we're talking about when we brought up the two things before, right? Being consistent and focused with an exercise plan and healthy eating. But basically we're talking about maximizing the quality of our life here. For them, that was their job. And dare I say for you, it's your job as well if you choose to be more healthy, if you choose to live a certain way. Now, I recognize that you don't have to choose to do that, but that's another story. So Malcolm Gladwell, who wrote the book Outliers, and if you haven't read that book, it's a very interesting read. He postulated that it takes 10,000 hours to become a master at anything. And I think that's something that the goats would agree with. Now, I don't know that we need to put in 10,000 hours. But on the other hand, maybe we'll be lucky enough to live 10,000 hours so that we can do this, right? I mean, remember, we are midlife here. So when we focus on this as a life plan versus a 30-day or 21-day fix, it takes on a whole new realm. And I want to speak to a minute about focus. And this just reminds me, of being a little kid, my mom would give us a list of chores on Saturdays and we would have to do them. And one of the chores was vacuuming certain rooms. And I can remember doing this as young as probably like age 10. But, you know, mind you, I grew up in the 60s and 70s when people had a lot of kids and kids were expected to do chores. I don't know what it's like now, but that's what it was like then. And that's what it was like with my kid, kids. But anyways, vacuuming. <laughs> this sticks in my head because my mom used to say, when you vacuum, we don't just go through the motions. We actually make sure that we get in all the corners and we do it in a fashion so that we get the entire floor clean. So it takes focus. That's the point I'm trying to make. And I don't know why it just struck me as funny. So I had to bring that up. Okay. So how about talking about how long does it really take to form a behavior. Okay, well, I found an article out of the European Journal of Social Psychology, a study that was done in or published in 2009. And the short answer to this is that it takes between 18 and 254 days to form a behavior. And it takes an average of 66 days for that behavior to become automatic. So here's what I want to point out, and this is why I do not like challenges. A 30-day challenge or a 21-day challenge is just not going to do you any good because it's not going to become automatic. When the challenge is done, you have no motivation if that were your only motivation, right? So let's talk about this phrase that I think we've all heard that it takes only 21 days to form a habit. This, folks, is urban legend. What it really is, is a misinterpretation of a book published in 1960. Wow, that's the year I was born. Okay, anyways, the book was called Psycho-Cybernetics, which I think is a pretty 
futuristic title for a book published in 1960, don't you? <laughs> Anyways, it was by someone named Dr. Maxwell Matz. And 21 was a situational observation that was made um, by him and the people that he worked with. And this situational observation actually became misinterpreted and adopted as fact. And so that's where the term, it takes 21 days to form a habit, comes from. And you can forget about that now. So let's go back to trusting the process. So speaking of kitchen renovations, <laughs> which I'm living with right now, I want you to picture yourself, if you haven't, or maybe you've already done this, I'm living it right now, so I'll give you my scenario. We are um, living amongst dust and dirt and plastic tarps and different traffic patterns in our house. We have a makeshift kitchen that goes between our laundry room, our coat room, and our dining room and our basement. And it's kind of like a mash unit. If you want to cook something, you literally have to go to like all four of those places to gather up what you need. The sink is in one place. The fridge is in one place. The oven. We're lucky to actually have an oven, but it's also on another floor. But anyways, thinking about that, right? And so it can be a little inconvenient to say the least. But I am trusting the process because I know that it's going to give rise to a new awesome kitchen that is definitely going to be an improvement on the old one. So my point is, I'm learning to trust this process and we're only three weeks into this process, which is definitely going to take two to three months. So that's just my little oh example at this point. But if you can trust the process and manage under circumstances that are less than optimal, eventually you're going to become satisfied. Now, maybe this kitchen idea isn't the greatest example because I know that it's temporary. And if you're trying to make a change, here's the difference, right? If you're trying to make a change, I want you to go back and think of those 10,000 hours because we're making this change for life. It's not a temporary situation. And so I think that's a really important thing to point out, except I really had fun with the kitchen example. So <laughs> bear with me. So how can you actually learn to trust the process? Because again, even that is a behavior and a mindset shift that you can't just wake up and say, okay, I trust, I'm in, let's go, boom. I mean, maybe you can, but it's probably going to take a lot more work and thought than that. So one of the things I want to say, a big key to this, is that you actually take on an attitude of enjoyment. Learn to enjoy the process because this process is life going forward, right? This process that you're working on, these new behaviors are your life. And so the sooner, sooner you decide to enjoy them, the sooner you're going to be able to live with them more comfortably. And if you can live with them more comfortably, you're more likely to have them become automatic. So guess what? I have some tips for you. Tips on how to learn to trust the process. Okay, here's one tip. Focus on the value, all right? So think of this. Each day that you eat the rainbow, the value of that is you have just done your body a fabulous service versus a day where maybe you subsided mainly on junk food, okay? So you eat the... Blah, there's my tongue tie for the day. <laughs> but you eat the rainbow and you see the value in the fact that you have honored your body. Yay, you. <laughs> Got to clap on that. All right? All right. Another tip is stop worrying about what you can't control. And this is something that comes up a lot in conversations that I have had with several people lately, right? We can't control how our body responds, right? How fast it changes. That's why I never say make a goal of losing X pounds by Y date because we simply cannot control how our body is going to be respond. And by the way, if this worked for you, you know, in your 20s and 30s, great, I'm happy for you. It worked for me too. 
but this is midlife now and you have a different body and so the old rules do not apply. So remember to let go of what you cannot control. All right, another tip, have faith. Get on board with knowing that we can't control outcomes, but that we can control our behaviors and we can learn to enjoy them, going back to tip number one. All right, another tip, practice gratitude. And you know this is an underlying theme, uh, and that's why the name of my memberships and my business is Grateful Fitness, right? Practicing gratitude changes your entire outlook, and your outlook determines your feelings and your decisions. So get on board with being grateful for what you can do. Appreciate the fact that you get to go to work out, right? Appreciate the fact that you get to eat the rainbow, that you have that available to you. Because for many people, it's not an option. Now, I don't want to go into the starving people in China thing, but maybe we'll go there. No, <laughs> just kidding. But right, practice gratitude. It's that easy. And maybe it's not easy, so it takes practice. All right, so here's another tip. Ignore the curmudgeons. You know, the naysayers, those people who are hell-bent on seeing you fail, forget about them. They don't matter anyway, right? Then they, maybe they're jealous or maybe they want you to fail. No, what are, no matter what their reason is, ignore them because they just don't matter in the long run. They're not the ones who are determining the length and quality of your life, okay? All right, so, and my last tip is to welcome failure. Hey, I want you to look at it this way. You have failed in life already so many times, and guess what? You didn't die. You're still here. You're on the other side of failure, and you learned something from it. So remember that growth comes from failure and that we have to trust the process of growth, all right? And remember this. It's not supposed to be easy, right? Change is never easy. Doing the same thing is easy, but doing the same thing will give us the same results. We know that. So we have to be willing to change. We have to be willing to trust the process. We have to be willing to fail and welcome that failure and see it as a sign of growth. So yes, it's uncomfortable and it's okay. It's fine. Life is not comfortable. But anyways, maybe this was too serious. I don't know, but I think it's it's worth revisiting. And this is something you may want to just you know, bookmark this, save it, save the link and come back to it every now and then when you get a little bit discouraged, especially when you have gotten sound advice and you really want to look at fast solutions. There are no fast solutions, okay? Living a better life requires changing your habits for life and sticking to them for life. So listen, Let's have fun with this, right? It doesn't have to be a Debbie Downer. The whole idea is to learn to enjoy trusting the process and to go with it. So I hope this helped you. It certainly helps me. And I, I do rely on these, these tips myself in order to get through these days. I mean, come on, some days, yeah, all I really want is a hot fudge Sunday. And I'm not saying I'm never going to have one. I'm just not going to have one every week or every day. So therein lies the difference. Listen, if this helped you, feel free to give a rating over on whatever podcast platform you're listening to because ratings and reviews are the lifeblood of podcasts. And it is my goal to get this out there to as many midlife people as possible so that they too can go on living the second half of their life in the best fashion possible. Anyways, I will be back next Tuesday with a new episode here on the Air Hug Community Podcast. Thank you for listening. Ta-ta for now.